Good morning and welcome to church. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning online with St. Mark's Lutheran Church of Waukegan. Uh, as we get started, let's take a pause and center our hearts before God. If you would like, join us with our gathering song, Lord of Light. This morning, we start out with confession and forgiveness, where we are reminded that no one is better than another, and we all are in need of restarts and forgiveness by God every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
This morning, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And from wherever you are tuned into this morning, may the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and you gladly give more than we either deserve or desire. Pour upon us your abundant mercy, forgive us those things that weigh on our conscience, and give us those good things that only come through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Then the Lord said, How great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done, although according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went down towards Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from me, uh, you do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it that from you shall not uh, the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of the 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked. And my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, 
even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship. Yet, because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So for centuries, the Hebrews had a fairly strict form when praying. They had a system of interacting with God. There were prayers for everything throughout the day that had been prescribed and approved by the Levitical class. Prayers for eating, prayers while walking, even prayers for when you woke up. There were even prayers for when you went to the bathroom. And an observant Hebrew could spend most of their day in prayer. And the heart behind this, you know, it's good. It's good to thank God. But the act of prescribing thanks can remove the heart of it. To require gratitude, to require prayers can place you in this loop of guilt. You can start to think, did I thank God enough? Or maybe, maybe my life would be better if I prayed more, thanked God more. We can begin to believe that God only moves in our lives if we first please God by our devotion. And I think that's some really dangerous God math. Number one, to think that God loves us on the basis of our behavior or devotion. The Bible says that God gives out his love for us, not because we've earned it, but because he loves us first and that there's nothing that you or I can do to earn God's love. It's, it's purely a gift. Number two on, on bad God math is to think that we can control God based on our devotion. And there are plenty of televangelists that use this kind of math. To get more from God, you have to give more, that God would move in your life if you just had more faith. But scripture says that God gives good gifts to his kids because he's a good father and he loves his kids. Number three, lastly, is to think that God only answers the holy people's prayers or specifically worded prayers, like somehow God needs the right person or the right words to be unlocked. But what Jesus lays out as a new form of prayer is actually incredibly casual from what was in the past. And while I think it's really good that we repeat the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, the original intent was to loosen up the Hebrews from a very regimented form of prayer. In essence, Jesus is trying to get those disciples to pray from their hearts. You got to remember, Jesus' disciples are, are good Hebrew boys who grew up going to yeshiva. They grew up going to a Jewish religious school. And those who didn't continue on to the higher levels of religious school, those who weren't religious enough, that didn't make the cut, they were told to get jobs like carpenters, shepherds, and fishermen. So when they ask Jesus, their rabbi, how they should pray, I bet they're wondering how hard this rabbi's teaching is going to be to follow. And Jesus gives them not a book of Leviticus, but this. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not a temptation. So, honor God, ask God to heal the world, sustain us, forgive us, soften our hearts, and keep us safe. Seems exactly what we would want now. So there's no wonder we say it every Sunday. It's a good thing. But let's break down this prayer. Let's try to hear what those disciples heard when Jesus gave it to them. And, and see how God would like us to pray from the heart with each idea found in it. So let's start with the first couple of words. Our Father. We start with, who is God to us? God is our Father, meaning it's a, it's a real relationship and we are his kids. God is like a father to us. 
And God says he wants to give us good gifts that we just need to ask. And so here is what we're asking from God, our Father, with the remaining requests or prayers or, or, or petitions. Things we are asking God to do or help us with. So what is the first petition? Hallowed be thy name. So what do we pray for in the first petition? We pray that God's name may be honored by us and by all people. What does it mean to honor something? That God's holy name be set aside. That, that God's name be given the weight that it ought to be given, given. Given glory. Because God's name has great power. When you ask things in God's name, God listens. The Hebrews so revered God's name that they wouldn't utter it from their lips. It is another example of Levitical overachieving. Remember our sermon from a few weeks back, how the tribe of Levites helped everyone follow God's commandments. They helped everybody play it safe. And, and if taking God's name in vain was a sin, then let's be really safe and let's just not speak it at all. Jesus relaxes that notion and says, you know what, go ahead. Go ahead and say God's name, but keep in mind who you are talking to. You are talking to the God of the universe. I was describing this past week how cool the new James Webb, Webb Space Telescope is to Enna, the largest of all telescopes ever launched by humans. The observatory will examine objects over 13.7 billion light years away, which is not only incredibly far, but those images are just as old. That light took just as long to reach us. And those galaxies and stars have moved and changed. Some don't even exist anymore. So we are seeing light from 13.7 billion years ago. The scale of the universe is incredibly hard to conceptualize. And I was talking to Anna, and Anna said, Wow, Dad, it makes me feel so very small. Me too, bud. But it also generates this sense of awe that something so powerful, creative, and immense would speak through Jesus to us. And that when we speak to God through the Holy Spirit, that that God listens. Second petition, thy kingdom come. What are we asking for in the second prayer? What does it mean for God's kingdom to come? We got to remember we're part of a great story that has been unfolding for millennia. In the very beginning, God existed within God's self in the Trinity. And then after some time, God created some angelic beings, and, and some worshipped God, while others chose a different path and fell. Then God creates the universe in all of its vastness and glory, and God creates mountains, lakes, and fish, and, and in his image, God creates humans. God gives them the will to choose freely, and at some point, they choose the wrong path. They fall, and creation itself is fractured and broken. But in the very same moment, God sets into motion a plan to heal what has been broken, to mend what has been fractured. Through hundreds of years, God's people, the Hebrews, carry this promise of redemption to fruition and Jesus is born. And through his gift, we are no longer separated from God. But the story, the story isn't finished. We live in a world that is not yet fully redeemed. It's not it's not fixed yet. We want God to finish this story. We want God's kingdom to come. So what is the third petition? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is and will be on earth the world as God intends. Whole, complete, not broken. And I would say that the world is far from whole right now, wouldn't you? I would love a little bit more of heaven on earth. Funny enough, that is our job, don't you know? Our job is to make broken things new, to bring them back to usefulness, to get them closer to heaven through God. So when we pray that prayer, we are involving ourselves in this, this plan of redemption. It's also a dangerous prayer. When you pray that, you are, in a sense, inviting yourself to be moved by God to do the fixing with 
God. Don't pray it unless you mean it, because God is going to move you. There's this absolutely beautiful Japanese art of repairing damaged pottery with gold called kintsuki. It restores functionality to a broken vessel, but it also adds beauty and worth. It turns brokenness to the most valuable part of the piece. They take the broken chunks of pottery and gently fit them back together with gold to make something even cooler than was before. It treats breakage and repair as part of the history of an object rather than something to disguise. These objects sell for thousands and are used for Japanese tea ceremonies. It's a, a bonding ceremony between people, taking something formerly broken and using it to bring people together. So what is God's will for my life? It is, it is this, to mend broken things. That's, that's your job, to find broken parts of the world, broken parts of creation, and go heal them back to heaven with God. So what do we pray for in the third petition? We want earth to be more like heaven, or, or what heaven is going to be like. There are some groups of Christians that strongly believe that heaven is somewhere else, that we will all be Star Trek teleported up to heaven and not have to deal with this mess on earth. But this petition makes it really clear that heaven is going to be here, and that when it's all said and done, God's intent is to make this place like heaven, perfect, holy, fixed. Now, not to get too esoteric or theologically nuanced, but people ask then, where is heaven currently? Where is heaven now? And there are two predominant theories that heaven is with God right now and will come to earth at the appointed time, aka when Jesus comes back, or that God is in control of time, is outside of time, and that we will all arrive in heaven at the same time. Either way, don't get too spun around, because the heart of the verse is that God's desire is that we make this place like God intends, more like heaven. Fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread. So what do we pray for in the fourth prayer? That God would give us all the things we need for our bodies and souls. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down and green pastors. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. We've talked about this at length before. Us Westerners imagine lush green meadows when they hear the word pastor. But green pastures in Israel, where the psalm is written, actually look like rocky, barren hillsides because it's a desert. And overnight, the warm, humid air from the sea condenses on cool rocks and forms these tiny little pools of water. And scattered amidst those rocks are blades of grass that grow up overnight. And where a, a drop of rain or dew collected beneath a rock, a single tuft of grass can sprout up. So every morning, a shepherd takes their sheep from through the desert from tuft to tuft and seeks out each tiny pool of water. And even though they eat all of one day's grass, the sheep, the sheep don't worry about where tomorrow's grass will come from. They just trust the shepherd to find new pastures for them. So Psalm 23's image of God providing green pastures is this challenge to trust God day by day. The good shepherd doesn't promise a life of luxury or long-term supplies, but he will always give us the pastor needed for the moment. And as his sheep, our job is just simply to trust the shepherd. We just need to trust God today rather than worrying about the future. And you may not see it now, but a new tuft of grass will always be there in the morning. How often do we want future assurance that every day moving forward in our future will be protected and guaranteed? But that's not trust. Trust is having faith that God will be there tomorrow, giving you exactly what you need. Fifth petition, fifth prayer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive those debtors. Now this is huge. We want God to be forgiving, but we won't forgive others. Or we can hold resentment in our hearts. In Hebrew tradition, there were cycles of forgiveness. Every year and, and every seven years of Jubilee, all debts would be forgiven. Indentured servants and slaves would be freed and everyone would be given new beginnings. 
Some Christian traditions even ask that before you take communion, that you make sure that you're good with the people in your lives, that you clear all of those relational debts. What do we pray for in the fifth prayer? That God would pardon our sins for Christ's sake and enable us to forgive those who have hurt us. The heart of the kingdom of God is forgiveness. Forgiveness is where the restoration of relationships begin. It is, it is the bedrock. Now, it doesn't mean forgetting. It's impossible. You can't force yourself to forget. But it means that you're not going to break that relationship more with anger and resentment. It does not mean letting someone walk all over you that isn't good for you. But it does mean letting some of that anger go. Anger does not restore things. It just breaks things more. It breaks you. It breaks the other person. So with God's help, we let it go. Sixth petition. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Keep, keep the things of this world that are going to hurt me, tempt me, cause me to stumble far away. Some translations ask to save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. What it's saying is when we pray these words, we're saying we can do nothing without you, God. In short, we're saying, we're confessing that with, without God, man, we are in trouble. If you've been to a 12-step group or AA program, this is where they start. This is the base recognition that we cannot do it on our own, that, that whatever you face, whatever temptation, whatever sin has the power to drag you down, that only God can help and that God wants to help and you just, you just have to ask. This morning, I, I hope you're hearing, there are no perfect prayers. God is just looking from, for prayers from your heart and you can make those prayers up you can use someone else's language. doesn't matter. God knows when you mean it. And the amazing news, the amazing good news is the God of the universe hears us and responds. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God, help us honor you. Heal a very broken world. Help us make it more like heaven. God, please sustain us, forgive us, soften our hearts for others, and keep us safe. We trust you and we love you. Amen. Watch within me, God. 
let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. Let us say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Rooted and built up in Christ, we pray for the church. Embolden church leaders to take risks for the sake of the gospel and equip the baptized to proclaim your extravagant love for the whole world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Rejoicing in the works of your hands, we pray for the natural world. Make rivers and lakes, oceans and all waterways sparkle with your radiance. Protect water sources and strengthen those who defend them. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Interceding on behalf of the vulnerable, we pray for the peoples of the world. Inspire all rulers and governing authorities with your justice. Guide the work of legislators and public officials that they advocate for the well-being of those they serve. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Persistent in prayer, we pray for our neighbors in need. To all who have hunger, give daily bread. To all who have bread, give hunger for justice. Open us to the cries of those who suffer. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Abounding in thanksgiving, we pray for this congregation. Bless the prayer and fellowship ministries in this place. Call us together in times of praise and blessing, trouble and sorrow, in your holy name. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised with him to new life, we give thanks for your saints who rest in your eternal presence. Join our voices with theirs as we sing of your great glory. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Now for our blessing, the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.